Welcome to Fantasy Cartography, the show where we see what maps can teach us about fantasy and what fantasy can teach us about maps. Today, you know that thing where humans are consuming the Earth's resources faster than we can produce them and we're likely to drive ourselves extinct simply because we can't manage our own consumption? Turns out that isn't new. First of all, this episode is being made as part of a collaborative project with the Australia and New Zealand YouTube Educators Facebook group. We're going to be spending the month of January making videos around the theme of sustainability. I might be the first person in the group to have made a video for this, but be sure to come back and check out the master playlist in the description to hear more great Australian and New Zealand science educators and communicators talking about sustainability. They'll probably be a lot briefer than I am. Now you may be wondering how the concept of sustainability applies to this channel's main topic of fantasy world building. Well to talk about that, I need to talk about one of the central conceits of Dungeons and Dragons, specifically the first word of the title. The idea of a dungeon as D&D presents it is actually pretty weird when you think about it. The worlds of D&D are full of ancient underground ruins absolutely loaded with gold and magic swords, and an adventurer can earn far more gold from a low-level dungeon crawl than an average peasant can earn in a year. Granted, one of the conceits of D&D is that dungeon crawling is a dangerous job and not every person is up for it, so the rarity of magic swords isn't exactly surprising. But it does raise the archaeological question of why the dungeons of Dungeons & Dragons are so much richer than the communities above them. The usual answer is that an ancient civilization built the dungeons, but all that's doing is shifting the question. Who were these ancient boffins? Why did they have so much more gold and magic swords than the people do nowadays? And where did they go? These questions are pervasive enough that I've actually seen some writers talk about the standard Dungeons and Dragons setting as being post-apocalyptic. Monsters roam the land, civilization is divided between tiny outposts, travel is dangerous, and the way to get the best stuff is by digging in the ancient ruins of a long dead civilization. Is that a description of the fantasy world of D&D, or the post-apocalyptic sci-fi of Fallout and Mad Max? Of course, Dungeons and Dragons is far from the only fantasy world set a few centuries after the collapse of an ancient civilization. It's incredibly common in video games. The Elder Scrolls games are full of underground ruins built by the long extinct dwarves, and recent Legend of Zelda games have been leaning very heavily on the incredibly technologically advanced ancient boffins conceit, which became a central plot point in Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild. And it's an element in a lot of classic, non-interactive fantasy, Conan the Barbarian's Hyborian Age began with the sinking of Atlantis, while the events of Lord of the Rings largely trace back to the destruction of Numenor. And it isn't just fantasy writers who like to claim that their civilizations are built on the backs of ancient boffins, it's a pretty standard part of most European national mythologies. Every European royal house and imperialist despot has at some point claimed descent from the Roman Empire, either by appropriating Roman symbolism or by outright making up lines of descent from ancient Roman heroes. The Romans claim that their founders were descended from Trojan kings, while Greek historians variously cited the Minoans and the Atlanteans as their cultural ancestors. I'm not sure how much this myth-making affects non-European cultures, but it certainly seems to be pretty ingrained in the European cultural mindset. And while most of these connections are vague or made up, there have actually been civilizations who lived on top of the ruins of their fallen predecessors. Think about Anglo-Saxons exploring the Roman ruins of London, Native American societies who lived near the ruins of the Anasazi and the Mound Builders, or even modern Indian people living near the ruins of the Indus Valley Civilization. Granted, from what little I know about these societies, those ancient ruins are often considered taboo or haunted and the only people who would go into them were the extremely brave and or foolhardy. But didn't we just talk about a fantasy world that worked kind of like that? So the idea of your fantasy civilization being built on the back of hyper-advanced ancient boffins certainly has provenance. But that also means that a fantasy writer needs to put work into it, otherwise it'll just come off as a cliché. And one of the most important questions you need to answer is this. If the ancient boffins were so advanced, why aren't they around anymore? See, the traditional thing to do in these stories is to leave the disappearance of the ancient boffins somewhat mysterious or even totally unexplained. 
That works when they're a minor background element of the setting, or when the mystery is left deliberately unsolved for purposes of analogy, as in Percy Shelley's Ozymandias. But like any literary mystery, the disappearance of the ancient boffins can become unsatisfying if your setting draws attention to its unsolved nature without ever actually providing a good solution. So let's look at some of the possible solutions to the mystery. In the Western fantasy canon, the explanations fall into four main categories. They aren't mutually exclusive, a lot of series will mix two or three of them together. I'm going to run through them in the approximate order of how plausible they are for real-world Earth civilizations. The first explanation is a magical or divine punishment for humankind's hubris. While this kind of thing probably doesn't happen in the real world, the idea of hubris leading to destruction is a really common element in classical mythology. Think about the Tower of Babel or Plato's depiction of Atlantis, for example. Some modern fantasy still leans on the idea of a civilization being destroyed as punishment for its hubris, but it's usually a bit more involved than the gods got upset and broke humanity's toys. It's often used as a sort of what hath science wrought story, but with magical research instead of scientific. For example, the dwarves in the Elder Scrolls video games literally vanished overnight because they were experimenting with the actual heart of a physical god. If you're going to use this one as an analogy though, I would really recommend caution. If you aren't careful with your metaphors, you're going to wind up in the world of caveman science fiction. The second common reason that the ancient boffins disappeared is that they were aliens, or ancient humans, all along. Like the previous reason, this is one which a few people believe can apply to the real Earth, but which probably is purely fictitious. The idea that a fantasy world is actually Earth, but way, way in the future, has become quite the cliché by now, and Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun series does it so well that everyone else's attempts are disappointing by comparison, but there are still a few interesting examples of human or alien settlement on a developing fantasy world. For example, the humans in Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern series are descended from far future spacefaring Earth humans, but rather than being descended from the last remnants of humankind or the survivors of a spaceship crash, the original settlers were refugees looking to go back to an agrarian lifestyle, and the technologically advanced human society is still out there in space. So Pern basically started as a commune full of space hippies. The third reason for boffin disappearance, and the first one that I'd personally mark as credible in real world terms, is a natural disaster or plague. Several historical civilizations have been destroyed by natural disasters. One example is the Minoan civilization, the early Bronze Age Greek society who built the first cities in Europe, best known as the villains in the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. About three and a half thousand years ago, the volcanic island of Thera erupted catastrophically, obliterating the Minoan trading hub of Akrotiri and severely damaging their capital city, Knossos, on the nearby island of Crete. In fantasy writing, one of the purest examples of a natural disaster wiping out ancient boffins is the destruction of Old Valyria, the loose equivalent of the Roman Empire, in A Song of Ice and Fire. The Valyrians, like the Minoans, were wiped out by an incredibly destructive volcanic eruption near their capital, and Martin's descriptions of the Valyrian ruins are obviously inspired by cities like Akrotiri and Pompeii. For bonus points, the Valyrians even left a bunch of magic swords behind. A lot of fantasy novels will join the natural disaster angle with one or two of the earlier angles. For example, Tolkien depicts the sinking of Numenor as a natural disaster brought on by the hubris of the Numenorean king, while in Sarah Douglas's Wayfair of Redemption, the ancestors of humans in Tensendor were humans from Earth evacuating from a magical plague carried by space demons. The Wayfair of Redemption is weird. The last common way that the ancient boffins were destroyed in fantasy novels is by warfare. This really pulls from the European nationalist mythology we spoke about earlier, especially with the influence of the Roman Empire, which was kind of destroyed by wars and barbarians, although the actual history gets complicated depending on whether you consider the Byzantine Empire to be Roman or not, but they might still count when you consider the Ottomans. In modern fantasy, this is often used as a Cold War gone hot analogy, with two sides of a war deploying insanely powerful magical weapons against each other, or in some cases the fantasy story might be set on a post-nuclear apocalypse Earth. By way of examples, you can see post-magical destruction worlds in the Dragonlance setting for Dungeons & Dragons or the video game Bastion, and post-nuclear destruction worlds in Terry Brooks' Shannara series or Adventure Time. So we've covered four main reasons why fictional civilizations collapse, at least two of which are plausible in real-world terms. 
but the most common cause of societal collapse in the real world hardly shows up in fantasy writing at all. And that's a shame because, in my opinion, it has a great deal of potential both as a story device and as an analogy for the modern world. The factor which has failed more past civilizations than any other is their failure to conserve resources. See, humans are by nature phenomenally bad at sustainable consumption. We move to an area and multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed and the only way we can survive is to spread to another area. Of course, Agent Smith is wrong to suggest that humans are the only mammals that do this. For example, elephants, goats and cats can be phenomenally nasty to the environment, but since humans have access to tools and resources which other mammals don't have, we have a correspondingly greater impact on the environment. Of course, the pinnacle of this kind of thing is anthropogenic climate change, a massive and complicated consequence of our failure to properly conserve and manage all sorts of different resources in sustainable ways. But a failure to conserve resources doesn't need to be anywhere near that complicated to have disastrous consequences. I highly recommend Jared Diamond's book Collapse, which explains how all sorts of civilizations have been brought down by their own lack of sustainability. Let's go through some of Diamond's examples. The Polynesian civilization that lived on Easter Island drove themselves into a massive population crash because the human settlers and the rats they brought along with them killed every single tree and every single land-nesting bird on the island. Without any trees, the islanders couldn't produce ocean-going canoes or make the rope they needed to haul those famous Moai statues, so the island's major industries collapsed, taking their social structures along with them. The Anasazi people, who lived in the area of North America now called the Four Corners, brought themselves to a similar end, cutting down all the trees in the area and wrecking the soil with erosion-heavy agriculture. Their capital city in Chaco Canyon was able to survive for a while by building a small empire of satellite cities to supply food and timber to Chaco, but that system couldn't survive a series of droughts in the 11th and 12th centuries CE. The Norse Viking settlers who moved to Greenland basically managed to kill themselves thanks to their own imported European and Christian cultural obsessions. They tried their hardest to survive off very marginal hay-based cattle and sheep farming, which ruined the fragile Arctic soils, and they built their houses out of turf, which meant that even more soil was consumed. They saw the native seals and caribou as an emergency food source rather than as a staple. Most of the Norse hunters spent their time going after polar bears and walruses for their skins and tusks, which were only used for trading with mainland Europe, and most of the money from that trade went to Greenland's churches, not to its hunters or farmers. Strangely enough, the Greenland Norse ate virtually no fish, despite living near some of the richest stocks in the world. For some reason, the earliest Norse must have developed a taboo against fish eating, which they never shook off. All of these problems were only compounded when the Inuit arrived in Greenland. The Norse referred to the Inuit as Skraelings, meaning something like wretches or barbarians. By all accounts, they mostly killed the Inuit on sight. One of the oldest surviving stories of contact between the two peoples refers to a Norse man stabbing an Inuit man by way of an experiment to see what colour his blood was. The Norse refused to trade with the Inuit or learn about Inuit technologies and techniques like spear throwing, whale hunting and how to catch the ringed seal, the only seal species which can be reliably hunted in Greenland winters. A cold snap in the early 15th century finally killed the Norse Greenlanders off. So here's my idea for fantasy writers and for anyone who is curious about how sustainable thinking can be applied in the modern world. The next time you read about an environmental resource crisis caused by humans, be it climate change, deforestation, dry land salinity, ozone depletion, peak oil, overfishing, desertification, or any other crisis which could be solved by a more sustainable use of resources, think about how a fantasy civilization would deal with that problem. Would they be able to push themselves into a sustainable lifestyle, or would they succumb to human nature, drive themselves extinct, and leave nothing behind but some ruins which a brave adventuring party will someday scour for treasure? And for bonus points, how is modern human civilization going to hold up against those questions? That's it for this episode of Fantasy Cartography, but you can stay until after the credits for the unrelated interesting fact of the day. Please subscribe to the channel and give this video a thumbs up if you learned something. You can follow Fantasy Cartography on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr, and anyone can ask me questions with the Tumblr Ask box, even if they don't have an account. I've also started a page on Ko-fi, a website where you can buy me a coffee over the internet. This series wouldn't have happened without the magic of coffee, so your tips can really help me out. 
And of course, you can always send me an email at fantasycartography at iinet.net.au. Until next time, may your fantasy be cartographic and your cartography be fantastic. One of the greatest success stories in sustainable resource management comes from Japan in the 16th and 17th centuries CE, the early years of the Tokugawa shogunate, who took power after the Warring States period. The end of that war led to a population explosion which in turn led to massive deforestation. In response, the shogunate encouraged lower population growth, smaller and lighter houses, the use of coal as a fuel, increased reliance on seafood and the mass planting of seedlings along riverbanks. They also put very strict rules on the use of timber, including ridiculously exhaustive censuses of how many trees were in every state-owned forest. In spite of its extremely high population density, modern Japan has the third highest percentage of forest cover out of all developed countries, behind only the much less population-dense Sweden and Finland. Bye.